Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, great to have you all here, and especially our candidates. And I know that we are all appreciative of the fact that they have stepped up to the plate and accepted to go through this process. And so we want to thank you, candidates, and we want to thank all of you who are joining us. We are going to try to do this in 90 minutes, because I believe any more time than that is just too much, <laughs> especially on Zoom. And so the way we want to work this out to keep it as fair and as uh, organized as possible is to have two minutes for each candidate to answer questions. And these questions have been compiled from the questions that all of you have sent. And some of them have been simplified. Some of them have been uh, modified uh, for, for time's sake, but they're all pretty much the core questions that will help us to know what our candidates are thinking and how they perceive the role of president of the House of Deputies and vice president of the House of Deputies. So it's, it's an organized uh, little system we've got here, two minutes each, and then we will make the transition to each candidate through these questions. There's eight questions. So the idea is that we go through 80 minutes of these formal questions and that the, the last 10 minutes are opened up to anything else that any of you think uh, should be asked. And remember, this is not the only forum. This is the first of two forums. We will have a second forum on June the 13th. Okay. It's a Monday, and I hope you'll join us for that. Let us begin with prayer. The Lord be with you. And this prayer was composed for the 75th General Convention. God, our wisdom, who eternally makes all things new, encourage by your Holy Spirit those who of us prepare for general convention for the building up of your world and your church. Counsel us when to act and when to wait. Turn our hearts always toward those in greatest need and away from our own preoccupations and fears. Help us never to forget the love and mercy, your love and mercy, your greatest gifts, given us all to offer one another as we see in them Jesus Christ, who alone is our joy, our way, our truth, and our life. Amen. Well, my sisters and brothers, I'm glad you're here. If you just joined us, we're going to uh, briefly introduce our candidates. And after, I hope you've all been able to see their CVs and their, and, and their experience, their bios are all very, very um, thorough and very impressive. I hope you had a chance to read those. But in these questions, I hope you get to know them a little better. So I'm going to begin with Devin Anderson. And uh, Devin, please unmute yourself so that we can hear you. Hello, Devin, how are you? Good, thank you. Tell me about how you discerned a call to run for president of the House of Deputies. Okay, um, well, hi, um, glad to be here. <laughs> Scrolled through and saw a lot of people that I know and love, so I'm just really happy to, to be here. Um, well, I have um, a daily spiritual practice and I've settled into that over the years. Um, and uh, just kind of, I'm kind of a diehard morning prayer person with some centering prayer thrown in the middle. And um, so discernment for me has to come out of that place, engagement with our scriptures and um, an open space for, for God and for the spirit. Um, tons of conversations um, with people across our church and um, my own friend and neighborhood networks and um, and also real engagement in all of the um, levels of governance <laughs> that uh, just a real abiding enduring sense that my gifts were being fully deployed uh, when I'm in the midst of, of church governance and the different uh, expressions of that. Thank you, Devin. You have more time. Oh, You're good? Fun. Yep. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to now introduce Julia Ajala Harris. Uh, 
Julia, good afternoon. Thank you, Father Coutier. Same question, I assume? Same question. Tell me how you discerned a call or tell us how yeah. you discerned a call to run for president of the House of Deputies. Yeah. Um, over the past several years, people have been coming up to me and asking me to discern this call. And, um, and I knew, and while I thought it was kind of pie in the sky and not something for me, um, I was coming near the end of my time on executive council and I was wondering uh, what might be next for me in ministry. And I was discerning all kinds of things, putting my name in for PB nominating committee, looking at the vice president role, what could be next for me. And um, when I became open to having that discernment time period in my life and I talked to people and was bathed in prayer, uh, to my own surprise, what emerged was a, a, a call to run for the president of the House of Deputies. And a calling is something that I take very seriously. It's something that I feel like um, is when Jesus asks you to come forward and invites you into God's mission. And the faithful answer to that is to say yes. Um, and part of that calling that was put on my heart had to do with uh, sort of confronting my own, in, um, how do I describe this? Confronting my own identity in the church and understanding myself and my uh, God-given image and the gifts that God has bestowed upon me in this church as a leader, but in light of being uh, a Latina and a lay woman, and that this would be something new for the church to see in this role. And I am so blessed and grateful to the other candidates who put themselves forward, who also have identities that we haven't seen um, on candidate slates like this before. And I think that is part of what God is calling us to do during this time. So I said yes to that call and I am here and I, it is vulnerable and transformative and brave. And I am just grateful to have people to journey, um, to, to walk this journey together. And so I'm grateful to be here. Thank you, Father Coudier. Thank you, Julia. Thank you so much. And I am going to invite Ryan Kusumoto to unmute himself. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Of Hawaii. There he is. Hi, Ryan. Yeah, thank you. Aloha, everyone. Good afternoon. Tell us about how you just turned a call to run for president of the House of Deputies. Thank you. I, you know, I would say that I am just super grateful for this church that in so many ways, since a young age, um, I have been a part of this church. Uh, my grandparents um, were a big part of my life and they dragged me to the 7 a.m. service every morning. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I sat there and I was able to from there grow in my experiences with, um, with this church. And I am super grateful because every part along the way of my uh, career, of my, my life experiences has been touched and guided by this church to the work that I do now um, with a social service agency, touching the lives of as many people as we can in our communities. And I think about that and I think about how that has formed me as an individual, how that has allowed me to think differently to think about all people so that no one gets left behind. I think all those messages that I've gotten and all the people that have, uh, have helped me along the way, like I just feel so grateful and fortunate of this church. And I think about those individuals out there, um, all of us, um, where this church um, is there for them when they need. And I think about how I can be a part of that. And I, I, I discern this role and talk to folks. And I think a big part for me is to be able to offer those same gifts that the church has afforded me back to, to this community, to back to the church, back to the folks that are not part of our community so that we can be there for folks when they need that. And so that all folks can enjoy and be and feel closer to God through this Episcopal church. And I'll just be honored and grateful to um, have any experience I can to continue to do this work for this church that has been so such a big part of my life. So thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Ward Simpson, all the way from South Dakota. Hello, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Wonderful. Um, discernment is something that's been a big part of my life since early on. And in, uh, actually in high school, I began discerning what am I called to do? What am I called to, to go? When I thought about what career I wanted to pursue, I thought of it in terms of discernment, not in terms of career choice. And, and like people typically would. Uh, at that age, at least. Discernment for me has always happened in community. Um, 
happened with with parishioners, happened with friends, happened with family members. I can I can't do discernment alone, and I don't think any of us really can. Uh, when I began looking and considering uh, the idea of being a call being called to uh, president of the House of Deputies, I looked back over the years, and I've had many conversations similar to or pointing toward this with people. Um, people who would say, you know, someday you might, and you know, kind of blow it off at the time, but still, it's a seed that gets planted. Uh, in, in the last two or three years, I've had some very intentional conversations with people. Do you think this is what I'm called to do? Because I know that without the voices of others, I can deceive myself. I need those voices from others. The other key part of it for me has always been prayer, both uh, specific prayer about the discernment to, to the call to the president of the House of Deputies, but also more general prayer, just having an active, regular prayer life that is part of the rhythm of my day, part of the rhythm of my life. Um, I'm very Benedictine in that way. The, the daily office is a part of my life. It has to be. When I don't do it, I feel the whole. I feel what's missing. And a big part of that for me is also listening. Um, not just listening to friends and family, but also listening for God's voice. What is God directing me toward? What you know, what reading today really stands out for me? What is there about that reading that is voicing something that I need to hear? Uh, so discernment for me has always been about the community. What does the community want, need? Uh, what is the community calling forth? Um, that's where discernment begun, begins and ends for me. And so I would carry out from there. Thank you, Ward. Thank you so much. Now we're going to the uh, first candidate we have for the Vice President of the House of Deputies. And so I invite Rachel K. Taber or Tabor? Tabor. Tabor. Rachel K. Tabor Hamilton, who is with us. Hi, Rachel. Hi, thank you so much. <laughs> Very glad to be here. Great, grateful. And um, I, that for me, the Vice President's role is uh, something that I felt myself sort of open my eyes to that because when folks in the past have sort of said, you know, have you thought about governance in the church? And my response to that has usually been a concern that uh, there might not be an opportunity to sort of do the kinds of things that I feel so drawn to, which is sort of cultivating a deep and authentic community. I'm an indigenous priest in the church, Shikan First Nation, and it literally is in my blood to want to gather people into community and to uh, really appreciate mutually our, the diversity of the church. And I see the opportunity for that in the vice president's role to do that connectivity between sort of how the dominant culture church operates and expresses itself uh, and, all, and, and to the diversity within the church and uh, in the global connections of the church in the world and the important advocacy work that we can be doing. So for me, it's, it's supporting peers, both lay and ordained. It is continuing to do education and opportunity for those kinds of networks and community building. It is in that model for me of the image of Jesus as a hen gathering chicks. It, it's a, a movement of my heart that wants to also gather together our the international identities of the church as uh, we center that as a core value in the church, that we have people who have different cultural expressions, different experience of the church, different stories to tell, different things we can learn from. And I see the vice president's role as something that could potentially do that, to, to really help the community of deputies uh, to, to focus on that, bringing a, a sense of mutual education and discernment and uh, joy because sometimes I get worried that the joy of community and the challenges of community don't have the opportunity to to be fully delved into so I would see the VP role as that and I know that Rachel time's up I'm sorry <laughs> I don't like to cut you all off but I, I have the two minute rule we gotta we gotta keep going thank Natives you like thank to you. talk <laughs> it was very complete very nice listen this second question, I think, is great because in that first question, we kind of got to know you all a little bit more in your discernment and your spirituality and your lives. I love that. But the second one's very, very direct. 
And I really want you to think about it because it's, uh, it's a good question. How do you propose changing the House of Deputies to respond to the post-pandemic church? Wow. Devin, you're up. Are you going to fluctuate the order or am I first each time? Do you want me to? Uh, yes, I'm like an off the chart introvert. I need a little let's time do, to process, do right? Let's do it. Okay, okay. we we'll begin with Ward. Ward, tell me, <laughs> what? how do you propose changing the House of Deputies to respond to the post-pandemic church? Through our time in COVID, we've all had to learn a lot of new skills, things we never thought we would be doing. Um, I never thought I would be live streaming Sunday worship with nobody in the space, right. preaching to literally preaching to a rubber duck. Um, my son put a rubber duck on top of the camera to help me imagine that I'm preaching to, to the congregation. Um, but there's so many other skills, our skills with Zoom, our skills with uh, new ways of communicating. These aren't new technologies, but they are new to us as a church. We've learned a lot of things. Some of them we need to set aside because they won't serve us in the post-pandemic church. Others we need to grab fully. Uh, my congregation here at Calvary Cathedral in Sioux Falls, we've, we've embraced the live stream. We're never going back. We're always going to do it because we found in addition to connecting us with those who are at home because of COVID, it connected us to our shut-ins in a way that we never realized was possible. Uh, we need to embrace those technologies that can help us in that way and use them and find ways to wrap our spirituality around them and work with them. How can how we use it in the House of Deputies? I think today's forum is an excellent example. We are having a church-wide discussion with the candidates. Everybody has an opportunity to meet us. This has never been done before. We are doing it most likely because of COVID, but this is such a wonderful opportunity, and I could see us holding a lot of conversations like this. Um, the current conversation that sparked in, in uh, social media, especially around baptism and Eucharist, I can imagine us having a whole series of forums like this where you know, good theologians who can do deep, hard work on it can come forward and talk with us, talk with us about it as a church and expand the opportunity for participation. It's all got to be about interconnectedness, connecting Thank us in new ways. Thank you. Can you all hear my little beeping sound? Yes. Or is it just me? Okay. Because <laughs> I don't like to cut you all off, but I, I have the little two-minute beeper going off. Uh, Ryan, uh, how do you propose changing the House of Deputies to respond to the post-pandemic church? Yeah, I think one what Ward is saying is, is, is pretty relevant to all of us, um, and I think that's important. I think we've learned a lot where our polity um, could be um, could be stretched a little to see how we can connect more with the, with each other. I think I mentioned in, in my um, statement about how for a lot of us in general convention, um, that's the first time we see each other. It's, we're, we're strangers to one another. And I think we found opportunities to connect more with each other um, during this pandemic. And I think connection is a big key for us um, in terms of getting this work done so that we can have conversations about these critical issues that impact our lives. Um, I would love to see us connect more in between general conventions and have those conversations. It could be educational periods, it could be open opportunities just to share ideas, um, but it could also be uh, you know, opportunities to see the stories that are happening within our church. There are important stories that are buried within um, our, our congregations that could be lifted up for all of us to learn from. And I think that's an opportunity for this office to lift up more of those stories. The other thing too, I would say is that, the, and I would philosophically double down on what COVID sort of reminded us on, and that is you know, that we're all connected. Um, we, we prioritized health in so many ways uh, with COVID, we shut things down. And you know, it reminded us, that, you know, before COVID used to be about how, health used to be about how well I ate or how much I exercised, but now if one person in the community has COVID, that impacts our health. It reminds us how connected we are. If you're not well, that matters to me. And we need to focus on, I, I think that message, of reminding us how important we are to one another, we need to double down on that because there are still communities within our church and within our community that are, are still on the outside and we need to bring them more to the center. Thank you so much. Julia, 
How do you propose changing the House of Deputies to respond to the post-pandemic church? Yes, I'm going to do my best to build on board and Ryan and contribute something new. Um, where I, where I, I want to also, that's your beep to get it started, right? <laughs> no, I'm not already over. Go, 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 go. Um, and what Ward said about, and Ryan as well, about how the pandemic has accelerated the pace of change it really has brought us much further into the future than what we thought we were gonna be seeing in 2022, right? So we've had, and I've served on one task forces that tried to imagine what the future might look like. We've had committees that talked about this. We had subcommittees of executive council where we even had a deputy propose, what if a pandemic hit, what would we do? And we all kind of laughed it off. Like, could you imagine? There's no way that's gonna happen. And then six months later it did. And so I think that we do need to look at how do we, um, like what Ward and Ryan said, how do we leverage technologies? But I would also want to look at and, and encourage folks to really look at the state of the church resolution that talks about studying the adaptive change we went through. And I don't want to say we want to do a whole nother study all over again, but I think we do want to see what worked and what didn't work when it came to having all of our legislative committee work done over Zoom ahead of time of general convention. And in what and, and starting that in November, did that work? Or is it better to start something like that in March? And how do we make sure that deputies are engaging throughout the triennium or this upcoming biennium in a way that also fits into their lifestyle? Because I know I've heard a lot of stories of people who are caregivers who were having a hard time negotiating their jobs, their legislative committee work, and their caregiving responsibilities. But yet at the same time, we know that this adaptive change, having legislative committees do their work ahead of time, is huge and potentially the future of how we could go about doing some of our work in the House of Deputies. Additionally, I want to also um, bring to build on what Ryan said about making sure that the House of Deputies and General Convention is more inclusive and accessible to people. And so being able to accommodate different people and their needs is something that we haven't, because we've had to prioritize health at this General Convention, we have not been able to include everyone the way that we would like, like Ryan had said. And that's something we need to address. And because I think I hear the timer going off, I also yes. wanna point out that uh, this, being able to do our work ahead of time would give us more time for community building and worship and future general conventions. And that's the thank, connectivity. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Deb. Thank you. Uh, let's go now with Devin. Uh, Devin, how do you propose changing the House of Deputies to respond to the post-pandemic church? Okay, well, I um, have had 25 years of having one foot in local faith community and leading local faith community and another foot in church governance. And so I'm answering the question from a church governance perspective and also a local faith community. Um, I had managed to lead a congregation through pandemic and, um, you know, I'm not a public health official. And um, it's been really challenging. And I think that kind of coming out on the other side is that the question is not so much kind of what the new normal is, but how do we as a church navigate fast and furious change? Because, you know, as, as coronavirus wanes and, and dissipates, we're, the, the fact that we're, we're navigating change at a, at a heightened level is still with us and is gonna be with us. So for me, I think that, um, one of my big priorities is the expansion of more places for adaptive change. And um, you know, Julia mentioned the House of Deputies uh, State of the Church Committee that did some really significant work around what, what are the conditions <laughs> that we need for adaptive change and um, what are some additional places in our um, interim bodies and in the life of uh, House of Deputies and Executive Council that we could really be doing some of that work. Um, and it's, and I think it would also be to pick the right priorities, um, pick what, pick the right conversations to be happening. Sometimes we kind of get off on things that may not be as impactful. Um, I think evangelism is huge and really re-upping our game and our intensity around evangelism. We welcomed new parishioners in our parish because people are looking for meaning. They're looking for community. They're looking in something to ground them that's bigger than themselves and church gives that. So, and mission, and also just a little plug. Another thing that the House of Deputies do, mandatory family leave. <laughs> 
So that, that's, my, that's my shameless plug uh, from my interim body committee. But um, there's some really tangible things we can do. There's theological um, responses and also kind of being you know, brave and uh, courageous and really trying to open up more spaces for, for, adaptive, uh, for adaptive imagining so that we you, can Devin. equip the church for, um, for that kind of fast paced change. Thank, Thank you, Devin. You. Let's go now with Rachel. Rachel, what would you propose uh, changing in the House of Deputies to respond to the post-pandemic church? Thank you. Uh, I think the challenges that I've been encountering uh, both within my congregational life with live streaming and meeting virtually and also in the legislative work working with the United Nations and working with the Anglican Consultative Council. In all of those things, what has definitely been the benefit is the ability to do that connectivity that we've all been talking about and the ability to uh, be inclusive. What I see as challenges that I would hope to, we could address together moving forward is a real need, firstly, to make sure that everyone who's being invited or has the opportunity to come to the table has the technology that they need. Uh, one of the things that's very true is in our in indigenous communities, our color, people of color, and also just all around the world, <laughs> it, it seems to be a, a challenge around the technology. And not everyone has it, not everyone has access to it. There's a kind of an assumption that everybody can get it. Uh, and I know that during the last COP gathering for COP26, uh, not a lot of people who we wanted to hear from and should have heard from have it. So I wanna make sure everybody has the right tools. The second thing would be a very a great importance for translators and to have those people available in a broad way, to have a real bank of those folks who are available to us and to have early translations and written as much as possible. The third thing I would say is how important predictability is in the meeting times and in the goals that are set for when work is to be accomplished. The moving targets have been a real frustration, but we know that this is just the reality of this particular convention. And uh, moving forward, I think we need to really have anchor dates uh, for people so they know when, they know what, and they know why. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to go to a question which is um, challenging. <laughs> and I hope you'll find it challenging. What's the most challenging or negative, I want to say, I want to add that, challenging or negative experience you've had as a deputy? And I'm going to begin uh, from the top with Devin. most challenging or negative experiences experience you've had as a deputy? That's a really fantastic question. Um, um, I think that I, I would say, um, so I started uh, participating in um, House of Deputies in 2003, I worked in the secretary, I was the volunteer coordinator for the House of Deputies. And then at the next general convention, I was in the sector secretariat, um, which was a really great schooling in House of Deputies um, and uh, our procedure at general convention. But I would say that, uh, so then the next one in 2009, I was a first time deputy and um, the chair of my deputation <laughs> and on a committee, a legislative committee. And I wouldn't say it was a negative experience, but I had no idea what what that meant or what that was going to look like, and um, would uh, would confess to a significant amount of overwhelm <laughs> um, during that general convention. So I think that it was, um, and at that time we really didn't have significant training for new deputies or new de or relationships for dep deputation chairs. So there was kind of like a lack of community for new people and also for new leaders and also um, training for legislative uh, committee people who were both new to, you know, who's all, who are also new to general convention. And again, that's kind of one of my big priorities and it comes out of that challenge and that uh, my own experience about trying to figure out um, the process, but also then be effective in it and to live into the roles that I had been elected to do and appointed to do. 
So, um, so I think that I think that that would probably that would probably be off the cuff. Uh, that would be one of the most significant challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. And now uh, I'm going to ask the same question of Julia. What's the most challenging or negative experience you've had as a deputy? Yes, thank you, Father Coudier. Um, this is a really hard one. Uh, and um, I'm going to be very honest. It is very difficult to be a short, youngish, Latina woman in the church. Um, it's difficult to be in leadership. It's difficult to be a deputy. Uh, so I've experienced uh, many microaggressions, many times where perhaps I was dismissed. Um, I once had a deputy that didn't want to high five me because they didn't want to uh, interact with me in that way, specifically because of my my gender and my background. Um, but I think that the time that it has been truly the hardest hasn't actually had to do with me because uh, I am a straight cisgender woman, uh, but it has had to do with times when I've been writing resolutions with other deputies and how we define each other. And so in particular, sometimes we are very good. We, or let me put, let me rephrase this. We have become much, much better, even though we're not there yet, at including LGBTQ people in the church, particularly the L and the G piece of it. But we're having a really hard time and we're getting a little bit better understanding the God given identity of trans and non binary individuals. And so when I have had the hardest time in the church, the worst experiences have been when and how we define woman in the church and that trans women count as women and that non-binary people are all, as well as trans people are also made in the image of God and deserve the same level of dignity and respect. Um, so I would honestly have to say that we have so much more work to do in the church. And, um, and, and to be honest, I'm feeling very vulnerable in this question, and, but I, I appreciate it because it allows us time to uh, be honest because honesty is the only way we're going to go forward as a church. So thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go with Ryan now. Ryan, um, what's the most challenging or negative experience you've had as a deputy? Try running dispatch for a convention. I'm just kidding. Um, so, you know, I would say this. Um, Maybe in somewhat some similar way, uh, a similar experience for me um, I had as a deputy was one that Julia just articulated. I remember one of my first um, general conventions, I was talking with someone and they looked at my badge and they said, what's your name? And, and I said, Ryan Kusumoto. And they said, well, that's a funny name. What kind of name is that? And um, it just sort of reminded me and opened my eyes that we have some work to do in this church. And I, it reminded me that, um, from my experience, and, and while that experience may have impacted me in a certain way, um, that there are far greater experiences or worse experiences that other members of this church face. And it struck me hard as I continued to think about that because that individual walked away and probably thought nothing more of it. Right. But I couldn't walk away from that. Um, that whole, I, uh, to me, that's the whole idea of, of privilege, that you can walk away from it. Um, and I think my experience and, and, the, and the many experiences of others, um, those kinds of experiences can play a significant role in how we operate within this church, how we feel about this church. And I think for me that it's those experiences that remind me that the work that we need to do really needs to be focused on how we bring more people again, to the center, or how we make sure that no one gets left behind. And it, it starts with all of us, um, even in a little interaction by just asking me about my name. Um, so I would say that would probably be my, um, one of my most challenging experiences. Thank you, Ryan, thank you so much. Ward, tell us what's the most challenging or negative experience you've had as a deputy. most painful experiences I've had have revolved around it, moments very similar to what uh, Ryan and, and Julia have said 
seeing the events like that happen, seeing events where people are put uh, in some way into a position that forces them to feel left out or attempts to force them to feel left out or accidentally makes them feel left out and not having a role to play because I'm too far away, I'm not involved in the conversation, whatever it is. Those are the most painful experiences I've had. Uh, the most difficult experience I had was in 97 at my first general convention. Um, it was during prayer time. Those of you who were around then will remember there was a lot of contention in, in the late 90s, uh, especially around the, the, uh, the issues of women's ordination was still alive and uh, uh, sexuality was a hot issue. Um, at that time, I was serving in the Diocese of Eau Claire, which was one of the more conservative dioceses. Our deputation that year, though, was fairly moderate to liberal. And during one of the Eucharist services, as we were sitting around doing Bible study, uh, one, one of the members from one of the other more conservative dioceses approached us to try and talk about not participating in the daily Eucharist, but having an alternative Eucharist. And it was, it was so challenging because... I wanted to, community is so important to me. Um, you know, we are the Episcopal Church. We are a church not united by common belief, but united by common prayer. The fact that we pray together is what makes us a church. Uh, and so to move away from that was just anathema to my thinking and to try and find a way to calmly and gently say, thank you, no, we're doing Bible study now um, without confronting, without causing a scene was was very difficult. Um, I'm glad I was able to do that. Um, and I'm amazed that I was the one that did it as the 35 year old rookie uh, deputy in a deputation that was uh, filled with much older people with much more experience. It was it felt very odd to me that I was the one that ended up saying it, but uh, I did. And it was, as I said, one of the most difficult moments I've had. At Thank, you, Ward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rachel, can you tell us what has been the most challenging experience or negative experience you've had as a deputy? Thank you so much. Um, one of the, the most important reason for me personally of feeling really called to answer this idea of being a, the vice president specifically of the HOD has to do with a real compassion I have and a desire I have to support both my clergy peers and lay leadership. And I have had too many experiences of folks not being empowered in the way that they, can, they need to be to be fully equipped and engaged in the governance of the church. Three conventions ago, uh, as a deputy, I had an experience of sitting uh, in session with the budget and finance folks and all of a sudden, there was a moment when Indigenous Ministries was going to be asking for a piece of money for some innovative development, as were other uh, folks of color within their respective ministries. And all of a sudden, three bishops came into that session, up to that session. They were given privilege on the floor, uh, although they had not signed up for that. And they asked for all the money that all of the ethnic groups were about to ask for, and they asked for all of it under their management within their respective diocese for uh, indigenous ministry. And so they were gonna control that resource, they were gonna direct that resource, and it was also taken away. We had um, folks of color and allies who were lay folks who completely were, were new to the whole process, didn't know what was happening, uh, and, and even I, who could see what was happening, um, didn't have the empowerment to stop it, didn't know how to, didn't know what. And of course, those bishops were given that money. Uh, away the empowerment and the possibility and the innovation of those of us who would have known exactly what needed to happen with that money. <laughs> and it took another two conventions to get us back on track from that experience. So thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel. The next question is, what is the most what is the most energizing or positive experience you've had as a deputy? And I'm going to begin with Julia. What was your most positive uh, or energizing experience as a deputy? 
Okay, it is hard going first. Um, I can't <laughs> jot down notes. Uh, I will have to say that um, for me, it's in some of the everyday stuff. And when you work together with other deputies, this past Tuesday, I had a Zoom with other deputies. We were working on a resolution from Legislative Committee Number Six: Sexual Harassment, Sexual Exploitation, and Safeguarding, and you know, we're able to bring all different kinds of people together with different worldviews to say, how can we make this better? And being able to all come together and be in agreement and be in consensus on, this is the way that we can move our church forward and its holy work and governance as ministry is unbelievably life-giving. And so in some ways it's um, seeing the sacred in the ordinary of what we do on the ground at the House of Deputies, you know, those times where in old times, pre-pandemic times, where you're in the hotel lobby and you're drafting things out and you're bouncing ideas off people. And it, it's, to me, it's in the same vein of how I can feel the spirit moving as when we worship together and when we eat together. Those times when we are able to share and hear each other's story and translate that into, uh, governance for the church through a resolution or a memorial to be able to call the church to live into the gospel of Jesus Christ for uh, for the sake of for the sake of bringing the kingdom of God is uh, just a an unbelievable privilege to me. Um, so it really has been a tremendous privilege to be a deputy during this time. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Tell us, please. What has been the most energizing and positive experience you've ever had as a deputy? This is a tough one because I think there, there have been many. Um, and, and thinking about my time as a deputy, I mean, you can go back to things like seeing historical uh, elections of presiding bishops from Michael Curry to Kathleen Jeffords Shorey to, to our work on marriage rights, um, to our the readmission of Cuba, the fight for all the justice issues that we, we go upon. The one thing that really stands out to me, though, is, is something that um, is a little bit more, I would say, organic in nature. Uh, last March, um, in, in March of 2021, there were some horrible events that happened to um, uh, some Asian women in Atlanta, Georgia. They were shot um, mm -hmm. at, the, at their place of work. And I remember mourning that, that those incidents and the many others that were happening at that time. The deputies of color were meeting and um, we draft, uh, the Asian caucus drafted a statement um, sort of decrying that. Um, and really echoing the words of Bishop Curry to, you know, to stand up, speak up and show up every time, you know, hatred or bigotry is directed at any child of God. So he wrote this letter to the church. And there was a moment there that I just stood silent because I saw the other caucuses um, just show up. And they said, we got your back. The Black Caucus, the Indigenous Caucus, the, La the Latinx Caucus, they said, we will sign that letter. And it was a moment for me in this church that shows the power of us collectively together. Mm -hmm. And it was just so powerful in the sense of when we can come together like that, we can make the difference. And to know someone has your back like that, I think that's why, I think that's when we are in perfect communion that way. And that's when we are a good church. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ward, what can you tell us about this? Um, what has been your most energizing or positive experience as a deputy? There are so many. Um, like Ryan said, there just there's so many. Every time we meet at general convention, there are hundreds of them that are big and small. Um, seeing an old friend across the hallway that you haven't seen for three years and taking the time to break through all the crowds to get to them, to exchange five words. Those are uplifting. Being there at moments of, of very important events where the church has made a big step forward in, in making a stand, taking a stand on equality, on justice. Those are tremendous. I've been privileged the last uh, couple general conventions to be up on the dais in the House of Deputies and to be within feet as uh, people are speaking and, and giving speeches that are absolutely essential for us to hear. Um, one I remember particularly from the last general convention, if you remember, we did the small group discussions. And when we were up on the dais, I was wondering, well, which small group am I going to be in? And I looked over and I'm all of a sudden in a group 
with the presiding bishop, the president of the House of Deputies, the secretary of convention, I got to be in that small group. Uh, the power of that moment to share with them uh, the, the spirit at that time. Uh, I have to admit, though, just a personal highlight for me happened. I think it was my third general convention. I was vice president of a, of a committee, and we'd had one of those 20-hour days. And I was walking down a hallway to turn in some reports. I was exhausted. I was tired. I was grumpy. And Gregory Straub happened to be walking next to me. And I kind of sarcastically said, well, are we having fun yet? And he stopped and he looked at me and he said, yeah, I am. And in that moment, I realized, yeah, I am too. Even though it's exhausting, there's a joy in doing that ministry, that work of governance that is just, that's when I became addicted to general convention, frankly. Thank you so much. Rachel, can you tell us uh, what has been your most positive or energizing experience? I think it, one of those would have absolutely had to have been uh, at the convention in uh, when we were signing, um, we had been asked to actually sign off on the piece of uh, legislation and the resolution for recognizing um, uh, LGBTQ people in all orders of the house. And then another piece where we were also uh, working on legislation for um, marriage rights of same-sex union. And so being able to, to be a part of that and you know, kind of recognize um, that, that equality as a, as a right in the church, uh, and I mean R-I-T-E and an R-I-G-H-T, um, you know, it, it was wonderful. And having the opportunity to actually sign on that and take a picture of it and seeing everybody and uh, so many people in the house doing that and putting it up on social media and being proud about that. And then that's, um, that same day, there was also, it happened to be the, the same day that the Supreme Court also recognized marriage equality and going out into the public park nearby and just uh, celebrating that uh, with, the, with the people there. I think that, that was a way in which there was a, 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 a wonderful connection within the house, a wonderful connection between the houses and a wonderful connection with community. Um, it just as a, as a huge celebration that I appreciated very, very much. As a, as a personal piece, I would say also at the last convention, being able to write and have passed a resolution, they gave us our indigenous theological educator in the Reverend Dr. Mary Crisp was a, a personal moment of ex extreme gratitude and pride for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Devin, tell us what has been the most energizing or positive experience you've had as a deputy. Well, again, I, it cannot be contained to one thing. I kind of have postcards from my memory and um, one of them was sitting on the floor um, and preparing to vote on affirming Gene Robinson's election to um, the Episcopacy in, in the Diocese of New Hampshire. And Ana Hernandez got up to the front and led us in this song and we prayed and it was quiet and it was full of energy and um, it was just a very sacred moment still brings me to tears. Um, all of the all of the conversations and debate and votes leading up to all the sacraments for all the baptized in our church and all of the Chicago consultation work and work that led up to us being able to move into that more sacred space together. Um, I served on the general convention or the joint nominating committee for the presiding bishop the last time around. So kind of the election of Michael Curry and that long walk from the back of the house all the way up to the stage and the dais and meeting gay and uh, was just charged. Um, also, um, I served on prayer book liturgy and music three times and once as the chair. And, I, and um, for me, like the sacred moments there were when we prayed and sang and nobody sings like that committee and um, just kind of that unifying um, experience. I have memories of Diane Pollard standing up and uh, moving to, to uh, commit millions of our dollars of our resources toward kind of this beginning work around beloved community and all of our opportunity to vote for that and to support that. Um, I remember Catherine Meeks's presentation in front of uh, in front of the House of Deputies, and uh, years before that, um, Jenny Tapa from New Zealand, who was the chaplain, and 
she read this amazing poem prayer that I actually to this day still have on my wall called what if we stopped talking um thank so thank just you, Devin. a thank whole you. bunch of consequential powerful spirit inf infused moments and there are too many uh to say thank you thank you so much our next question um has to do with how would you or what would you do what would you do as president or vice president to help elevate the voices of marginalized communities within the Episcopal Church. And I'd like to start with Ward. Thank you. Um, as we move into the uh, post-COVID uh, environment in the church, and hopefully we use more and more of this technology, I think one of the critical pieces for us is going to be making sure that everybody has the opportunity to have those voices be heard through that. Um, there are communities that don't have access. I know here in South Dakota, we have a number of them. In fact, I'm fairly certain that one of my deputies won't be able to watch this forum uh, live. We're going to be recording it for him because he doesn't have broadband internet access to his house. Um, these are realities. We need to, as a church, do everything we can to include, to reach out to those who are marginalized, not only because of color, but also economic status, uh, gender issues, whatever the issues are, the marginalized are where Jesus spent his time. It's who he ate with, it's who he, who he reached out to, it's who he ministered to most. We need to follow that example and go where people don't want to go, go where others won't listen, you know, listen to those who others won't listen to, uh, give voice to those who don't have a voice. And as the church, we need to be out there, and as president of the House of Deputies, there's a strong voice to be used to push the church in those directions, push the boundaries, uh, encourage people to speak up, and to make sure that they have a forum where they can speak up, to make sure that they are respected in that and uh, given the full opportunity to voice their, their concerns, their needs, their hopes, their dreams, their prayers. Uh, and we will all be enriched by that. Thank you so much, Ward. Rachel, can you answer the same question? What would you do to help elevate the voices of marginalized communities within the Episcopal Church? Thank you. Uh, as a vice president who would be deeply dedicated to supporting you know, lay presidency in the House of Deputies, I think that I would really want to be doing that connection I was speaking about earlier in terms of being, being very intentional, creating intentional opportunities to sort of hear some folks who identify as being marginalized for whatever reason and being very invitational and intentional about creating those listening opportunities and then creating action plans that can actually make a difference. Uh, you know, the work of the triennial period in between conventions, I think, uh, needs to be understood as times of advocacy and resource building. I think, too, and another direction of it is also educating the dominant culture church about what the issues and the needs are that contribute to the, this experience of marginalization for people. So there's education involved for the whole church. I um, have been a part of uh, a co-founder and developer for networks of color in my diocese, but also what's an allies network. And what we're finding out is that most of the time that the reason the dominant culture church isn't necessarily responding to something is they don't know there's an issue because they don't live it on a day-to-day -day basis. They don't see it on a day-to-day -day basis. They don't even have to think about it. So it's a lot of education, a lot of awareness. And uh, I, I really believe that people who are in the church majorly have a heart for community and a heart for connection. And they simply need to, to be shown how, to be shown invited into those opportunities, but also to be um, formed in a way where they enter diverse conversations respectfully and in a way that doesn't cause more harm. So I would want to work in both directions on that issue. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Julia, can you tell us please um, what you would do to help elevate the voices of marginalized communities within the Episcopal Church? Yeah, thank you, Father Coudier. Um, so one of the privileges of the President of the House of Deputies is to be able to have what in political science circles where I'm getting my dissertation is called an agenda setting function. 
And so the president of the House of Deputies can make a priority to be able to hear from deputies who are in dioceses that are outside the United States, to be able to hear from deputies who, are, who identify as people of color, who identify with intersecting identities, multicultural, multi-ethnic, multiracial folks, to bring to the table people who have different abilities or a different gender identity or gender expression. And I think that one of the ways that I've been able to show that I um, see this type of ministry, this sort of break, like making sure that there's room at the table for everyone. Um, just as a quick example off the top of my head, this past year, I've been able to, to exercise as chair of mission within a joint standing committee of executive council to exercise some of that agenda setting by making sure that we have space in the fall meeting of executive council to hear from three indigenous leaders about their experiences being indigenous people in the church and their stories of the indigenous boarding schools. So that way we could understand why it was that we as executive council, as the board of directors of the church have to look into our own history. So, and storytelling is an amazing way of doing that. And in the same way, I was able to also push into the agenda a listening session with trans and non-binary leaders across the church in January, so that way we could have a similar understanding of what people's real lives are like. And one of the reasons for doing this is to be able to teach the system, and the system in this sense being the church, to hear from these voices, so that way we know how to include them in everything that we do. And it is through that inclusion and that old time sit around the fire and listen to the stories that we make these connections with people and we value them. We see the image of God in them. And so is that the beeping? It is. I will stop. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. Ryan, um, what would you do to elevate or to help elevate the voices of marginalized communities within the Episcopal Church? You know, first of all, I just I feel like this is our call. Um, every Episcopalian is called to do the work of equity, equality, and, and dismantling racism and any other barrier that sits in the way from us to be in full communion with one another. Um, it's allowed me to focus my life's work around direct service to bringing marginalized voices you know, to the center and, and deal with complex issues in our community. But this is really one about you know, really um, in, engaging and bringing forth the beloved community in my mind. And to me, my sense on this is a lot of what some of the folks have said earlier, I think we got to do a better job of truth telling. Um, there are stories out there, as Julia mentioned, um, but we that, that need to be told. Uh, we have to take those bold steps to bring those voices forward um, and, and allow us all to hear. Um, we can't sweep it under the rug. This doesn't go away and um, or resolve itself on its own. And so we need to tell those stories and we need to heal from those stories and then find ways in which we can move on. Um, the other thing is, um, is really ask ourselves, what, what is our responsibility in this place? In Hawaiian, we have a word called kuleana, and it means responsibility, but there's a deeper meaning, and that meaning is about um, the privilege of responsibility. And I think we need to think more um, about the, the work that we do, that it goes beyond the transactional type of things, the checkbox type of trainings that we do, to be more transformational. And there's a couple of resolutions, there's just general convention that are asking for that more trans uh, transformational experiences um, for this church to be a part of, especially with this body who is making the decisions for this church that we love. And finally, I think there's a lot of personal responsibility that we have to do. And then that, that this office needs to find more ways to provide opportunities for those personal transformations to occur, the personal accountability. I think Rachel talked about it. You can't get well if you don't know you're sick. And I think we need to find those places <laughs> with ourselves where we don't realize that we're sick. And, and work on those issues. Um, and so I think those are there's so many opportunities to call that out. Um, a lot of reflection, a lot of, 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 of conversations. Um, and I think this is a, a, a place where this, this office could help bring forth some of those opportunities to come forward. Ryan, thank you so much. The next question, are there particular oh, could, I could I Could I answer that question? Oh, Devin? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I, oh, I, I, thought, didn't... I thought you I thought you had. No. I, I skipped you. I'm sorry. No, no, fine. It's fine. I actually uh, is it okay to go. Yes, go ahead, please. Okay. Um, I actually in interpreted the question a little differently. Um, and kind of elevating the voices of marginalized people in the church. And I 
um, interpreted as elevating at the table in our church in our church governance. Um, Kevin, can you repeat that kind of because we lost generally your signal. And more we lost oh, your okay. signal for a little while. Okay. We'll give you extra time. Just can okay. you repeat that? Yes, I have um, children who are using our Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> not a good you're time sharing, you're sharing your signal they're sharing my signal yes we'll <laughs> talk about that later um uh so i what i was saying is that i interpreted the question a little differently um and kind of less general and more um elevating kind of how to elevate the voices of marginalized people in church governance and getting uh, voices um, to the table, voices of change to our table, to our collective table around church governance. So, um, so that's kind of the way that I thought to answer it. I think that, um, you know, that kind of how we lead and if, you know, kind of in leadership roles and kind of the choices that we made are as important as kind of what we do. And so, um, you know, I would really want to kind of shout out to Gay Jennings about her capacity and her investment in inviting new leaders, um, people from the margins out into appointment uh, by appointments and um, into our leadership. And I think that that's all about relationship. That's about the, the president and people in governance being in relationship with uh, advocacy groups and the caucuses, the deputies of color, UBE, trans Episcopal. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of, um, voices of change that are out there that are um, really impactful and can show us the way <laughs> as a church. And um, so kind of being in relationship is raising up and identifying leaders um, on ramps to, you know, where, where are the, where's the leadership and where are the voices that, um, that our caucuses really believe should be at the table and need to be at the table. Um, so kind of looking at that as more of a, uh, cohesive uh, project for all of us. And so that's kind of how I would, how I would answer that. I think that, um, I think that bringing the voices in and then creating an environment that's receptive to listening to what, uh, to the, to those voices is also critically important. Um, and that, that is the role of the president of the House of Deputies. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Let's go to the next question, everyone. Are there particular concrete things that you want to accomplish as president or vice president? I'm gonna start with Rachel actually. Are there particular concrete things you want to accomplish as the vice president? Thank you, yes. Um, what, there's a couple of things. I kind of have put them in one of the essays that are associated with our candidate profiles, but um, there, are, there are a few things. One of those has to do with continuing to, as others have said, uh, connect with our international capacity as a church and our communities as a church. And again, in ways that provide opportunities for dialogue throughout the triennium uh, and uh, education and even potentially speakers panels and just more and more opportunity to hear from one another, learn from one another and understand each other uh, in what our needs are as communities and as church. There is also, I would love to see and be a part of as a vice president, uh, helping to create an evaluation tool for our diocese and for our deputies in uh, use for looking at our congregational life, you know, uh, it within the context of wherever our congregations are, wherever they are, however they are, whatever money they have, whatever leadership model they have, but to assess but what are the genuine needs of that community? And in some cases, it really isn't money. It might be another kind of resource that someone else in the church could provide. Uh, in creating partnerships and collaborative efforts within the church, um, again, people can't support needs if they don't know about them. <laughs> so it's helping and uh, educating one another about realities within our context, but an evaluation tool for every uh, congregation or bishop or deputy uh, to be able to use to see what the needs are within their context. Uh, and then finally, it's for me also as a vice president position, an opportunity to be a, a voice and bring up and highlight 
where the conversations, critical conversations are happening in the church and critical innovations that we can be sharing and becoming aware of so that not everyone is having to reproduce a, a solution but can learn from one another. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Ryan, um, are there any particular concrete things you want to accomplish as president? Yeah, I think I'd, I would echo what Rachel has said. Um, what I think is really important is that, um, you know, our polity is great, that it allows us all to inform the, you know, our collective thoughts and bring forward the view of this church that we, we feel it should be. I think there's more opportunities to bring that forward, though, um, bring, bring forward the views from our church. Um, and I think to use the time in between general convention um, to bring forth more voices. I talked about storytelling being one. I would work quickly to find more opportunities to bring those stories that haven't been told yet within our church of parishes that are doing some amazing work of um, individuals who are, who are struggling with issues that the church needs to hear about. I think those are really important things for us to share so that we are better informed about um, the, the work that we need to do and, the, and the, the pieces of this church that we need to work on. The other piece though that, that I might add is that the one in, in Hawaii, there's, there's this sort of mantra that we all sort of adopt. And we say, you take care of the kids and you take care of the elders. We call them keiki kids, kupuna for elders. Take care of the keiki and kupuna. Everything else sort of takes care of itself. And, and the idea is that if you center the voices of those two areas, we'll, we'll be okay. I, I do think we have to do a little bit more work around our folks um, who are on the youngest side because we're creating a church and we're leaving behind a church for them to be a part of. And I think we have an opportunity to bring forward more voices from our youth um, to help us understand what is the church that um, they want to see as, as they grow up and because they're our future leaders. I really believe in putting together a youth caucus um, for this church to help inform this body to help us think about where we might be in, in, the, in the next what we leave behind um, for for this church. Um, and, and same for us, for us as we age to look forward to how will this church continue to be there for us um, as we get older and, and be there for folks. So thinking about um, working with CPG and as well as other um, entities of this church to really bring forward those voices, I would say those are the kinds of things I would, I would focus on. Thank you, Ryan. Devin, are there particular concrete things you want to accomplish as president? Yes. Um, I have a big list, but I'm going to just say just say a few of, of just say a few of them. I think it's my um, Enneagram number. I'm a one. So, you know, I got to reform everything and change everything. Um, you know, I think that for me, um, the, 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 the core of everything is about um, working on some culture change around our, um, our around relationality. <laughs> Um, a, a lot of places where we govern, where we make really critical um, decisions are not um, collaborative. <laughs> they're not trust, they're not trust, there's not trust building, there's not relationship building. And um, to me, that is the primary work that any group and governance is to do is to build relationships with each other in order to um, create trusting environments where it's okay for people to take risks and put themselves out there and speak the truth um, and have good idea, you know, interesting ideas, crazy ideas. So, so I, 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 I that is a huge thing is about um, our relationality and our building our relationships with each other. Um, I think that um, the other thing is that we don't right now have a compelling or any strategic plan for where we're going as a church. Um, what, what is the compelling vision around which uh, feels urgent and motivating and, and how do we get there? And in the midst of all of that, how do we make decisions about our money and our, 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 our financial resources? So I think we have a lot to do around visioning and strategic planning as, as a, um, as a church. And finally, the last piece I would say is that um, we have uh, from the hard work of a lot of uh, people here on this call and also in the wider church, and we have a path forward around, um, around beloved community and moving ourselves toward beloved community. I think that um, its success, it will be contingent upon uh, our capacity to hold each other accountable. <laughs> Um, have some tenacity 
be willing to evaluate and change adjust strategy based on evaluation. Um, I think that that kind of accountability piece and that um, strategic piece is something that would be that we that would be some culture change for us. We commit to all kinds of things, but the follow up and the accountability and keeping ourselves focused uh, with some tenacity is is something that would be um, top of my list. Thank you, Devin. Let's go with Julia. Julia, are there any particular concrete things you want to accomplish as president? Yes, thank you, Father Coutier. Concrete things. All right. So one of the things that I have discerned and thought a lot about is how this next president of the House of Deputies is likely to be looking at their career in phases. So the first phase would potentially be uh, this upcoming biennium, right? And then if the same like if I were to be elected president of the House of Deputies, I would look at this as the first biennium, and then I would look at how I would partner with the future presiding bishop to co-create along with deputies in the House of Bishops, the future for the church going forward. In the meantime, I have done a lot of discernment and thinking about what would be the fruits of ministry in this first biennium. And the first, of course, is the over 700 appointments that the president of the House of Deputies makes. And to be able to bring people to the table that have not been typically heard from, to use relationships to create networks among those 700 plus appointments, depending on how many task forces we have and that sort of thing. I also would want to shepherd three specific initiatives during this biennium time. And the first has to do with truth telling. So there is a new executive council uh, committee on indigenous boarding schools and advocacy. And I would want to make sure that they are well established to be able to do the work that they need to do. There's also a resolution coming from uh, the presiding bishops working group on truth telling, reckoning and healing, which I've been serving on. And that is, talk, is looking at our doing some historical research about where we have, uh, how we have obtained our wealth as a church. So connecting it to how we got our land and how our investments have been built off of slave trade. And so to all of that, to tell our story honestly about where we have been, how we got where we are now, in order to create a more authentic Christian community going forward, because that's what young people wanna see. They don't wanna see status quo and they don't wanna continue seeing um, like patriarch or white supremacist systems, systems continue on. They wanna be able to see that we're actually critically looking at who we are. Additionally, um, I would also want to ensure that we have safeguarding in Spanish, French, Creole, and American Sign Language with closed captioning on all of those. Because as we start looking at more and more evangelism, especially towards these communities, we have to ensure that we have a safe church that they're coming to. Thank and so Julia. we have to think holistically about that. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Ward, um, are there any particular concrete things you want to accomplish as president? Um, a number of things that I would say would echo what the others have said. Uh, in particular, though, there's one that that stands out for me, and that is the idea of building a supportive structure that uh, encourages and enables the increased mission partnerships at all scales, from the local level on up to the to the churchwide level. Uh, we are stronger when we work together. Too often in my ministry, I've seen small congregations struggling when the congregation next door practically and in my terms you know serving in northern wisconsin and now in south dakota next door can be an hour or two away um, but the congregation next door has a similar resource or has been through a similar issue and has some strengths that they can bring to the table but somehow those aren't connected and i think we need to do structurally find ways to enable that all the way up and down the scale, find dioceses that can support one another, be in partnership with one another uh, and encourage that. Find churches that uh, other denominations that we can reach out with and work together with in partnership. Uh, here in the Diocese of South Dakota, one of the things we're doing is a project called the Bola Lakota Project. Um, the idea is that every congregation is going through and intentionally looking at how can we increase our relationships? How can we increase our re outreach to, uh, to, to build our relationship with God, to build our relationship within the congregation, and most importantly, to reach beyond the congregation into our community? 
every congregation is undertaking this project. Every congregation is looking through finding ways, big or small, whatever it is, find something you can do and then begin to build on that. Um, and it's not about having a lot of resources to do it. One of the things we've specialized in in South Dakota is doing things on a shoestring. Um, when my congregation went to live streaming our Sunday services, our initial investment was less than $300 to get us from not doing it at all to being able to do it in a fairly professional looking way. Um, things can be done on a shoestring. It doesn't take a lot of resources, although resources do help tremendously. And those part of those partnerships is going to have to be finding not only needs that are out there, but also resources that can balance with them and work with them. Uh, Lord, the last you. thing I would do is build on the existing pro successes of building beloved community and sacred ground series like that. Thank you, Ward. Thank you so much. Our next question, I think it's an important one. How do you understand the relationship between the House of Deputies and the House of Bishops? And we're going to start with Ryan. I think it's in a really, I think it's a really important one. Um, we were built, um, you know, while we have two houses, our polity is designed to have two houses and move legislation, you know, tactically through both houses. Um, our work with our bishops is a critical one that we stay in communion with them um, always. Um, you know, we sometimes have different views. We sometimes um, have different minds of our, our, of our houses. But I think that's what makes us, you know, a good church, allows us to decipher and bring forth the different voices of our church. We have a lot of stuff going on right now, a lot of resolutions um, about open communion, about um, other types of theological stuff that I think a lot of us are on different pages on with, with our House of Bishops. Um, well, one internally within our, own, within our own house, but also with the House of Bishops. And I think it's the, it's the beauty of that that allows us to think through those types of you know, tough issues and get to a place where we, we find some common ground. But we can only do that by working together um, with our bishops and staying in, in communion with each other as much as possible. And I think what's really important is for the president of the House of Deputies, whoever that might be, and the presiding bishop to continue to work real strongly with one another. They don't always have to agree with one another, but I think the, you know, the opportunities show the grace and compassion and communion they have for one another for this church, I think sets a really strong tone for the rest of our church to model after. And I think the, the for me, the importance is setting that tone at the very top. And that, you know, I, I commend our current presiding Bishop Curry, as well as um, presiding uh, president of the House of Deputies, um, Gay Jennings, for really working hard to build those relationships at times when our houses can be um, divided on certain issues. So. I, but I think that's that's where it starts. Thank you, Ryan. Julia, can you please tell us how you understand the relationship between the House of Deputies and the House of Bishops? Yeah, my understanding is somewhat similar to Ryan's. Uh, it there there is this inherent creative tension between the two houses that uh, I think sometimes when we create friction together, we can end up with something a bit more beautiful in the end. It's the same thing as when you bring people together with different worldviews and you're able to come up with something more complete uh, by working through it together. And so um, I, I see the House of Deputies and the House of Bishops as members of the same family. I am from a very large family. I have two different familial cultures, one that is first-generation Mexican, one that is like seventh-generation Midwestern raised on mayonnaise. And you know, they almost have nothing in common. And so I'm very accustomed to being that bridge between different worldviews. And as Ryan said, I think the president of the House of Deputies and the presiding bishop, their relationship sets the tone for the two houses and the relationship between the two houses. And they're that bridge. And so when we have a healthy bridge, then we have a healthier governance structure and, and our church is healthier. And, and again, and I see this in familial systems and in organizational systems in the same way. And one of the things they think that is important for us to keep in mind is that we are all in this together. Presiding Bishop Curry reminds us of the words of Martin Luther King Jr. that we will live together or die as fools, right? If we can get along or 
or not. And it's not about seeing the same things the same way. It's not about always being in unity, but that creative friction is and learning from each other is what makes us a stronger, healthier church if we do so with trust and relationship. And, and again, uh, to reiterate what Ryan said as well, the, the relationship between the president of the House of Deputies and the presiding bishop really sets that tone. Thank you. I'm going to ask Ward to answer the same question. How do you understand the relationship between the House of Deputies and the House of Bishops? I've, I've often thought about this relationship and, and marveled at the, the genius of Bishop William White when he, he first con conceived what became uh, our, our general convention. We really, although it, it on the surface is bicameral, as you said, really, if you look at, at the rules of the House of Deputies as well, we can function, and on big issues, we do function as in a tricameral cameral nature. It's not just the House of Deputies and the bishops, it's the bishops, the other clergy, and the laity. All three have to come to consensus on a big issue for the church to move. We have to work together or we can't do anything. Uh, and I think that's a marvelous expression of the wisdom of the, the history, the wisdom of history, the wisdom of, of Bishop White, but also the wisdom of God being expressed in our midst. We are, we are better when we are together. And on critical issues, big issues that are changing how we do things, that are moving us to a new concept, that are engaging us in a new way. It's important that all three voices be heard, that all three of those communities have a strong opportunity to express and be brought along. Uh, if we can't agree on it, we shouldn't force it on one another. We need to come together, as I said, build consensus. Um, and that means listening to all the voices, hearing all the voices, and the more voices we can hear, the wiser we will be, and the more full and complete our understanding of what God is calling us to do will be. Uh, ultimately, General Convention, in my mind, is not a political entity, it's a discernment tool. It's how the Episcopal Church has chosen to discern God's will for the church. And it functions best when we all engage in it fully and energetically and embrace one another, and most especially embrace one another when we disagree. Because there is a common ground there, we need to dig for it and find it. Thank you, Ward. Devin, how do you understand the relationship between the House of Deputies and the House of Bishops? Um, always changing. And I have a sense about it from our past and where we are now and kind of what's possible for our future. Um, I think that you know, all of us in the past have, um, those of us particularly have been around for a while, seen when uh, we're not working well together, when we're not in relationship with each other. Um, and um, and have seen had witnesses examples of when we're we're together and we're unified. Um, I think that at its essence, we are all um, we're not congregationalists. We're an Episcopal church. I think in our essence that we're all grounded by mutual uh, and common interests and um, rooted in baptism and our baptismal theology our baptismal covenant, our Trinitarian theology. There's so much more that uh, binds us together than uh, that can hold tension <laughs> and hold difference of opinion. And to be fair to the House of Bishops, there's as much diversity of opinion there as there is in the House of Deputies. So, you know, kind of one thing is, you know, how are we, how are those two houses in relation to each other? But also there's just diversion, uh, diversity of opinion within the houses. Um, I would say that I, I think that, again, kind of this uh, energy that I have around really um, putting some intentional work into our relationships with each other and building trust, I think that an example of that would be um, trying to figure out how what we say in public matches what we say in private. That, you know, in Minnesota and our kind of passive aggressive uh, culture here in my state, you know, there's the, the meeting that happens in the church and then there's the meeting that hap the real meeting that happens in the church parking lot. That's right. So um, I think that I think that we need to start naming some of those things and holding ourselves to our higher ideal um, in our, our in our common theology and our common uh, uh, spiritual practice. Thank you. Rachel, 
How do you understand the relationship between the House of Deputies and the House of Bishops? It, the moment you asked that question, the image that came to my mind that made me laugh um, was the Victorian bicycle called a penny farthing, which had one really big rear wheel and a little tiny front one. And, and I went, yeah, you know, because of so many of the conversations have to do with who thinks they're the big wheel and who thinks who's really perceiving the other as the little wheel <laughs> to making us go forward. And, and in my engagement with some, not all, you know, with some bishops, they definitely think they're the big wheel on the penny bar thing. Um, and, then I, and then I, you know, other kinds of times I've heard the House of Deputies say, hey, dudes, there's more of us. We're the big wheel on the penny bar thing that's making us go forward. Uh, and and then just kind of looking at that and kind of I think that's actually okay that there's this kind of you know back and forth around uh, around who who's the influence because there's a way in which that calls uh, both houses into understanding how they impact our decision making and, and the responsibility for that it, it, when you're reflective about it the but how, I referred to earlier about a situation you know kind of having these bishops come into this PBNF meeting and kind of grab some resources uh, and then taking a couple of conventions to correct it. Well, when we made that course correction through resolution at the last convention, one of those bishops was like, <laughs> he just, and he came over to me actually in the convention, in the um, exhibit hall. And he was just like, wow. And, and in front of everybody just kind of going, and I was just like listening and going, yeah, you know, it must've been upsetting to have all of a sudden not feel like the big wheel. <laughs> You know, and and I had other deputies come over to me, you know, after he left and said, are you OK? Are you OK? And I said, that's actually the most authentic communication we've had about this issue. And I value it. And then later we met for lunch in a pub <laughs> and we're able to, you know, and, and that's how it needs to be. We need to have all of that expression and all of that creativity that comes out of that because it's authentic. So the relationship I see us really needing is that authenticity in all the ways that the others have described. And it begins one-on-one -on -one relationships and our willingness to engage them. Thank you so much, Rachel. The last question is, how do you understand the relationship between the president of the House of Deputies and the staff of the presiding bishop? How do you understand the relationship between the president of the House of Deputies or the vice president, Rachel's case, and the staff of the presiding bishop? And I'm going to begin with Julia. Okay. Well, the president of the House of Deputies and the presiding bishop staff, that relationship is the president of the House of Deputies role is threefold, right? They preside over the House of Deputies. They are the vice chair of executive council and they are the vice president of domestic foreign missionary society. And in, in all of those three roles, the PHOD does not supervise the presiding bishop staff. They are the presiding bishop staff. And instead, the PHOD or PHA, depending on how you prefer to say it, we can code switch. There's all different ways of saying it. Um, they are a ministry partner to the presiding bishop staff. So again, there's in some ways some of that similar sort of creative tension that I mentioned earlier, where you have the president of the House of Deputies who is pretty independent and, uh, and has their own separate agenda setting function for the House of Deputies, but the presiding bishop staff are accountable to the presiding bishop. And so they work together in a lot of ways. We've been able to see that with President Jennings and uh, the PB Curry's staff where when they, you know, they're able to come together on issues about racial justice and some other things and we can see fruits of their ministry together. But in, there is not a direct supervisory role between the president of the House of Deputies and the PB staff. That is of collaborators in ministry together. And again, I think that all of that is based on relationships and trust and, um, and, and being colleagues in the ministry together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Devin, how do you understand the relationship between the president of the House of Deputies and the staff of the presiding bishop? Well. Honestly, I don't have much more to add than I thought Julia had an excellent answer there. I think that, um, you know, I think part of the, I think optimally the relationship is that, is that we understand our roles and we minister fully in our lanes. <laughs> um, and I think that, um, I think that the resource, I think that they, the staff are incredible resources 
um, to, um, you know, while the Pietro Dios Julia was saying is not in any ways in a supervisory role with the with the staff, but the staff bring incredible, they bring their own constituencies, their learnings, their expertise, their support. Um, and that's really been a huge part of um, my experience on executive council is that the, just the staff is just constantly informing and guiding and contributing and working. And um, so I see them as partners. I see them as um, incredible resources. I see them as dynamic <laughs> ministers in our church that have tremendous. So I, I think that, you know, again, there's no oversight, but that, that, that is a partnership and, um, and it has to be again based in some kind of work around relationships and um, a re relational connection and a constant rootedness in our in our um, shared theology. Thank you, Devin Ward. How do you understand the relationship between the presidents of the House of Deputies and the staff of the presiding bishop? I guess I just want to say ditto. First off, I mean that the idea that. Uh, the president of the House of Deputies doesn't have a supervisory role. Obviously, that's there. Um, the relationship has to be one of collaboration and cooperation. Uh, one role I see the president of the House of Deputies having um, is to be that voice from outside. And I don't use that. I mean, it's not the perfect word for this. But you're nearby, you're part of, but you're not inside the staff structure uh, there. To be that voice that can either support or challenge uh, the staff to think more deeply about something, um, again, from outside the structure, outside the formal structure, to be able to come into somebody's office and say, hey, have you thought about X, Y, Z, um, in a way that doesn't confront them, doesn't challenge them in any way that would impact their, their employment or, or threaten that, but rather as a partner in ministry, I want you to think more deeply about these opportunities that you may have missed. Uh, or to come in at a time when somebody's really feeling uh, a, a need, uh, had a bad day, had a bad time, uh, a bad period of time, and say, hey, you're doing good work. To be that voice from outside the structure, but still with some uh, moral authority to say, you're doing good work. You really are. Keep it up. I know it's hard, but it's valuable to us. And I think those are roles that the president of the House of Deputies can bring uh, in, in a way that really strengthens and supports the staff. Thank you so much. Ryan, what can you tell us about this uh, relationship between the presidents of the House of Deputies and the staff of the presiding bishop? I should really be able to say ditto because I think <laughs> the three folks before me, and I'm sure Rachel as well, will will say something very similar. You know, I think it's really critical that there be a good relationship that we have to be. There's nothing that we do in this church that is singularly by ourselves. And that the more we are able to work together on things, um, the better. I think when you think about the staff, uh, what they bring to the table is this, you know, they have the day-to-day -day experience. They have the historical knowledge that surpasses typically president of the House of Deputies um, tenure. So you really got to rely on that knowledge and wisdom that they have and lean on that. But Ward's right. I mean, it's there's also an opportunity to, to bring forth the the voices um, from um, for which the, the president of House of Deputies represents, and that's all the deputies. And you know, a good example of that is sort of this uh, this thing that we're calling this year the General Convention, the the shortened General Convention. I mean, it, this was a, a place where we were deciphering a, the big change for our church, and it involved all of us sort of listening together. Um, the president of the House of Deputies office, the GC, the General Convention office, sort of working together and, and leaning on each other and their attentions. They're right. I mean, we, we wrestle with these things because some things are hard to do, but some things we know we have to do. And I think the only way we can do that is to get that done together. That's the only piece I could add to maybe um, what uh, the three um, other candidates said earlier. So thank you. Ryan, thank you. Rachel, uh, how do you understand the relationship between the president of the, or the vice president of the House of Deputies and the staff of the presiding bishop? Thank you for that, because I want to put this in the context of what it would take, you know, for, for me to have an opportunity to be the VP. And what it would take is if the House of Deputies elects a layperson, then the canon of the church is that someone who's the VP has to be from the opposite order. So if we elect a layperson as president, and I'm in that role, that's an awareness to have because 
uh, as vice president, I'm supporting a lay leader who is in a relationship with that staff of the presiding bishop and the presiding bishop staff. And um, I hope you're not all shocked, uh, not describing this to that staff specifically, but I hope you're not all shocked that there can be clericalism in the church, right? <laughs> there just can be that sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes it's not even intentional. It, it can just be an attitudinal position. Um, and so I would see my role as vice president to, to a lay presidency uh, to, to make sure, to keep my eyes open, have that person's back in those relationships. And, uh, and also to address it, any kinds of issues like that, or even support and advocacy of the uh, agenda of the president and the needs of the House of Deputies, to do that in a way that isn't conflictual, doesn't contribute to conflict, but um, provides opportunity to enter into a more deepened and authentic relationship. And in my native tradition, there's a role called the trickster. And the trickster sometimes can look like they're kind of bumbling around or suddenly introduce something very odd into the mixture. And I would see myself, you know, introducing things in a, in a way that are just playful, joyful, uh, and, but also truth telling and, and, and creating an opportunity in a way that's non-confrontational to say, this is the work of the church. And it is, as others have said, about healthy relationships, especially within us as an organization. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. So my friends, we've gone over our 90 minutes, but if anyone has a very, very, very pressing question uh, that you'd like to add, uh, you can put it on the chat. It's just going to take us some extra time. And please remember that we do have another forum scheduled on June the 13th, also at 2 p.m. Eastern. And uh, probably we may end up with more candidates by then, because I think there's at least one more person who stepped up to the plate for the role of president of the House of Deputies. And I would imagine maybe somebody else will step up for the VP position, I do not know. But I can tell you that um, I love the fact that we've had all these uh, amazing folks. If you have questions, I'm being told right now, if you have additional questions uh, that um, were not in this forum, please uh, email contact at houseofdeputies.org contact at houseofdeputies.org and it's a great um, .org. <laughs> it's a great way to uh, get your questions in. Uh, I thank you all for those who contributed to the eight questions that we used today. They were phenomenal. Um, Phyllis, explain to me what you mean by that. Can we save the questions? Oh, okay. All right. We'll, we'll save them for next week. Okay. I get that. Okay, Phyllis. So Phyllis has suggested that, and I think that's the feeling of others here. Thank you all candidates for stepping up. Thank you all for answering your questions so uh, eloquently. And I think everyone really got to know you all a lot better and can appreciate the great gifts that you all bring. So my friends, have a wonderful Pentecost weekend. Come Holy Spirit, come. <laughs> Wear red tomorrow. <laughs> God bless. Bye-bye. <laughs>